Good morning, Covenant Connections. Good morning, good morning. So great to be with y'all. I'm humbled, honored to be here in the great state of Georgia. How many of y'all love Georgia? I'm grateful because we are here this week and it snowed in Indiana where we're from. We're church planters. Our father's house is in Avon, Indiana. Planted that church about six years ago and continue to labor and plow there in the Midwest. But I love Georgia. So many doors have opened here and so grateful to God for what he's doing. I'm looking forward to being at the North Georgia Revival tonight. Anybody ever heard of the North Georgia Revival? <laughs> Excited about that opportunity as well. I have a weighty word this morning. And I feel the burden, but also the grace of God for what he wants to say this morning. So before I even begin, I just want you, if you're willing, just to open your hands to the Lord. This as a sign of receiving from him. Because this word is going to require you to open your heart. This word is going to require you to open some places and some doors that maybe you would prefer stay closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, we're asking Holy Spirit that you would bring conviction that you would bring comfort, that you would do what only you can do. Lord, I just thank you for your presence. I thank you for your word. I thank you that your heart, your Father's heart is here among us today. And I thank you, Lord, that you love us, that your grace is sufficient, that your mercies are new every morning. Lord, right now, would you just wash us, your people, I ask, Lord, that your presence would sweep through this house. God, that you would blow open doors, that you would break down every box, that you would smash every wall, that you would break chains. God, I'm asking in Jesus' name, I plead the blood of Jesus over this house. And I thank you, Lord, that this is a house of healing, that this is a house of miracles, that this is a house of restoration, for you have ordained it so. And I thank you, Lord that a greater measure of healing is here by the power and the blood and the name of Jesus and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. And the word I have for you this morning, I've titled, Overcoming the Power of Shame. Shame is not something that we talk about often, but it is something that affects all of us. And I want to take you on a journey in the Word of God from the garden to the fall to redemption in Christ. So there's going to be a weight here. There's going to be some things that some of you may get in touch with while I'm preaching. And I just want you to know it's the Lord. And I want to encourage you to open your heart as the Word comes forth and just say, God, whatever you're doing right now, I bless it. I welcome you in. I don't want to resist you. I don't want to fight you. Would you open my eyes? So shame is a lot like pride in that it's very difficult to see. Listen, if you don't think you struggle with pride, you definitely do. If you don't think you struggle with shame, you definitely do. We're, we're in a wrestle, we're in a fight, we're in a war, and God is moving us from image to image and glory to glory. He's moving us from faith to faith, and we are all on a journey to become like Jesus. Now, Jesus felt no shame. Jesus never bowed to fear. Jesus was the most liberated person that has ever existed. He was the most congruent person that ever lived. Meaning who he was in private is who he was in public. He didn't put on a show and he didn't know how to perform. He just knew how to obey. And I believe that we're in an hour in the body of Christ that is critical where the Lord is dealing with performance. He's dealing with the things that we've wanted to sweep under the rug. And I'm here this morning to tell you that in the Father's house, there's no carpet, there's no rugs to sweep things under. God is bringing not only exposure of sin, but healing for shame. So this is a word of healing. Yes, this word will cut, but this word is meant to heal. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. And if we have our slideshow prepared here, I'd love for you just to put the title up, Overcoming the Power of Shame. I want to begin and teach this just in three sections. The first section, if you're taking notes, is called Foundations of Shame. 
And I'm going to lay out just a biblical grid from the Word of God. Foundations of shame. Turn with me and read in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. It says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, verse 18, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now hold on just a minute. This is in perfection. This is in the Garden of Eden, yes? So I want to ask you a question. If it wasn't good for man to be alone in perfection, how bad is it for us to be alone in sin, in isolation, in a fallen world? See, isolation is a huge problem. It's a huge issue that plagues the body of Christ. And I believe that God is calling many people out of isolation and into real fellowship. Now that doesn't mean he's calling you out from watching church online to put, putting your butt here in a seat on a Sunday morning. We're talking about real fellowship. We're talking about who really knows you. Have you really connected with God in a meaningful way? And by the way, work precedes the fall. He put him in the garden to cultivate it and to keep it. Work is not a bad thing. We should be training our young people how to work and work hard. I don't need somebody else to work for me. I will work because God has graced me to work. If you believe in hard work, say amen. amen. Verse 19, out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature... That was its name, so he gave him more work. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep. Would you say deep sleep? I just sense by the Spirit of God that some of you need to rest. I feel a restlessness by the Spirit of the Lord, and some of you need to embrace the rest of God. When you're in the place of rest, you're not striving. You're not trying to earn something. The enemy plays tricks on us and he tries to get us to earn from God what he's already given us. It would be like my sons coming up to me and begging that if they could hit a home run, they could be my boy. You're already my boy. You don't have to do anything to earn this. This is our relationship and that's how God wants to relate to us and us to him as father. So a deep sleep was upon the man and he slept. Verse 21. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now I'm going to avoid teaching on family and on marriage, and I'm going to focus in on shame just for a moment. I want you to know something. This here is a 1972 Kennedy Half Dollar. It's a half dollar, so how much is this worth? What if I turn it over? How much is this worth? It's not a trick. I know some of you, math was a struggle. 50 cents, 50 cents. This is man and woman, both created in the image of God. We have equal value but different function. One side is the head, the other is complementary. But there's great competition in the body of Christ and in the earth where men are divided against women. Why? Because the power of shame causes us to compete. And I felt like I was supposed to say by the Spirit of the Lord that you need 
need to stop competing with your spouse and start honoring them. Equal value, different function. Hang with me. The man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, I think if you understand the power of shame, that Genesis 2.25 is one of the most miraculous, ridiculous verses in the Bible that two people could be naked and not ashamed. That they could have zero self-consciousness, no insecurity, and no embarrassment whatsoever. Now let me lay a foundation of shame. Brennan Manning says that shame is the single most negative force in the human soul. There are things that we've done that we're ashamed of. And there are things that have been done to us that we're ashamed of. And the solution for those things is different. Now I want you to know as we make our way through this message that two things are simultaneously true, and we have to hold them in tension. Are you ready to hear what they are? You are deeply loved, and you are deeply flawed. We are deeply loved, and we are deeply flawed. And we have to embrace that this is what the gospel teaches us. This is what the word of God. It, it comes to embrace us, but it also comes to cut us. And I find that what you see is that some people get a little too much, get a little too drunk on you are deeply loved without realizing we're deeply flawed. And that the beauty of the love of God is that He loved us in spite of us. And He loves us because we're His. So the whole issue of I, I don't feel worthy, yeah, that's the whole point. But God says you're worthy, so you don't feel like it. It's not about your feelings. It's about the Father's declaration over your life. You are worthy. You are enough. Let's try again. You are enough. But can I tell you the reason why the Lord sent me here to deliver this word right at the beginning of 2024 is because you could have a room full of people screaming at you, yelling at you, whispering to you. You could have a mariachi band in your bedroom every morning telling you how sweet. That would be weird, wouldn't it? Telling you how sweet and wonderful you are. And saying you are enough, but shame will prevent you from receiving the truth. Some of y'all people's compliments, people's encouragements literally just bounce right off you. I've tried to encourage people before and I, it's just... I, okay, we're, we're not getting anywhere. Why? Because they're, they're covered in shame. Because what I'm saying disagrees with what you believe. I remember one time I was in a drive through years ago. And I'm just pulling up. I'm not even really engaging the Lord. And the Holy Spirit says to me, Paul, you have a disagreement with me about who you are. I said, can I just order my cheeseburger in peace, Father? Just let me eat my feelings. Why? Because we turn to food because really we're reaching for mom. So shame is comprised of three parts. Number one is exposure. Dan Allender defines shame as the fear of being exposed. Exposure is a component of shame. Those of you that have ever felt shame, which is everybody in this room... It had to do with exposure. Number two is embarrassment. Shame carries with it deep feelings of embarrassment. Deep feelings of unworthiness, of inadequacy, of worthlessness. It's a very crippling feeling. Remember, it's the single most negative force in the human soul. Perhaps our wrestle is less with the devil and more with our shame. And how he weaponizes it against us. The third part is contempt. Now, I want you to see it like this. Contempt is like smoke where shame is the fire. 
I don't know if any of you were athletes, but I was. And the culture surrounding sports is largely built on contempt. It's built on making fun of each other. Some of you dreaded those moments in the locker room. Why? Because somebody who was ashamed was going to put you down to make them feel better about themselves. And really, the biggest bullies are deeply ashamed. Some people, y'all, they, they haven't cried in a long time, and it's not because they're tough, it's because they're numb. God gave us tears. Tears are a gift. If Paul the Apostle, who saw healings and miracles, could say and describe his ministry that he was serving the Lord with trials, humility, and tears, may that, comp- may that make up our lives and our walk before God. What, what if somebody would describe your journey as there were trials, but there was humility and there was tears? I've been asking the Lord for a week now, God, would you open up the tear ducts of this place? Because I believe that some of you are overdue for a good cry. And it's not just emotionalism. It's God working on your behalf and working through you. How are we doing? I also want you to understand that shame goes much deeper than guilt. Guilt is... I've done something wrong. I've done something bad. But shame is, I am bad. I am wrong. In other words, guilt is more like an action where shame is more like an identity. And shame will cover you. And shame will hover over you. And shame will actually cause you to live a life of fraudulence because you want other people to perceive you in such a way for something you're really not and for someone you're really not. And I'm concerned that the church, some of it is built on performance. It's built on giving people the best image. Y'all, this is why social media can be so toxic. Because it gives us all an opportunity to create a fake persona. Here's what I want you to see and know about me. But there's a whole host of stuff that I would be deeply ashamed if you knew the truth. Men manifest shame as the fear of being perceived weak. Y'all, I don't know how many men's breakfast, men's meetings I've been to, and all we talked about was work. I get, give men 10 seconds. Where do you work? Where do you work? Where do you work? Why? Because we find identity in what we do, but that's not really who we are. This is why when a man loses his job, he goes into a total identity crisis because he just lost who he is. But you're not your job. You're not where you work. You're not your ministry. You're a beloved son and daughter to the Father. And He defines you by His love and not by your efforts and not by your performance. Amen? Okay, so we have a bit of a foundation for shame. Are y'all tracking with me? Is this okay? Feel like we're getting a a grip on this? This is just going to be a giant Holy Ghost counseling comforting session, okay? And it's free of charge. Hallelujah. Section number two is called feelings of shame. So we had number one, Foundations of shame. Now I'm going to keep reading and transition into section 2. Feelings of shame. Genesis chapter 3. Keep reading with me. We just read the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Verse 1 of Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now stop one second. The enemy is a master of trickery and one of his best tricks is convincing us that God is holding out on us. 
I don't know how many people I meet and they are serving a withholding father. They, they actually fast and their motive is to get God to do something. Lord, help us. I'm just going to pray right now. I feel the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, we ask you again for another wave of your presence. Lord, we love you. We invite you. We welcome you. God, would you be the comforter? Would you wash us your people? Lord, we're asking for tremendous breakthrough. We're praying for shifts in hearts and minds and marriages and families. God, I pray that you would go to those places that we don't want to talk about because you were there and you know and you're a healer in Jesus' name. All right, let's keep plowing. So he tells her, God's holding out on you. Verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Now all of a sudden, because of the serpent's deception, Eve sees the boundaries and consequences that God laid out, not as protective, but as restrictive. Y'all, some of you are, are bumping up against the boundaries and the borders and the consequences that God has warned. You know the truth and you're trying to suppress the truth. You're trying to ignore those feelings of conviction. Those are the boundaries and borders of God. And the enemy wants to make you think that God is holding out on you and that he is restricting you when really he is protecting you. Can I go here for a moment? Having sex outside of marriage is a disaster. It will ruin you. You will pay a high price. Did you know when the scripture says that if you sin sexually, you sin against your own body? And the special penalty that we pay for sexual sin is shame. Why God's trying to protect us. Hey, make a covenant. Commit to one another. Don't give up on each other. Why? Because sex is a beautiful gift. It's powerful. But it's meant to be harnessed in the confines of a covenant. Am I at covenant connections? Yes. God wants you to have a covenant connection with your wife, with your husband. And you have no connection with anyone else. God, please raise up a generation of people that would turn away from TikTok and all the trash and all the sexuality and live pure and holy and righteous before the Lord. I'm trying to save some of y'all from a lifetime of pain. I feel it in the Holy Ghost. Let's keep going. Then the eyes of both of them were open, verse 7, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Now please notice that the minute that they feel shame, they go to cover their sexuality. It's their first impulse. Wearing clothing is normal to us. Why? Because we just grew up and we just breathe shame like we breathe air. But it wasn't meant to be that way. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, would you say hid themselves? They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now we have great shame. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. What's he doing? He's blame shifting. Orphans blame everybody else. Sons and daughters take personal responsibility before God. You got to trade in your victim card and grow up in Jesus. 
Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you've done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. What's she doing? She's blame shifting. So God comes and he addresses Adam first. Don't miss that. He addresses Adam first. Did he kill Ananias or Sapphira first? And he's going to address the man. He's going to address the leader. Stop blaming the dysfunction in your home on your wife, bro. What is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So God's addressing Adam. Adam's blaming Eve. Eve's blaming the serpent. The serpent deceived me and I ate. Now I want to just submit this to you because this is a grid that God has given me. You can do with this whatever you want, but it's been very helpful for me. In this story, in the first 10 verses of Genesis 3, what I believe we see is pride is what opens the door to all sin. That when Eve looks at the tree and it's desirable to make her wise so that she can be like God, it was her pride that opened the door for the fall of man where everything starts from this point of origin. But not only did her pride open the door for sin, but then came all the shame once. Once she did sin. So pride feeds shame. But then look with me here in verse 10. I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. So our pride opens the door. Shame covers us. And it feeds this horrible fear inside of us. So I submit to you that if people are in a struggle. Or if you are here this morning and you are in a wrestle. You are dealing with pride and or shame and or fear and I don't know that anything else is really going on in the human soul other than those three things so, so you can go after and chase every rabbit and walk down every hole and path but really pride, shame and fear this is the foundation of the orphan spirit this is the foundation of living apart from God and being independent and wanting to rebel and have it your own way it's pride that opens the door and only the spirit of God can speak to us and humble us and open our eyes and show us our deep need for God this is what's wrong with the whole world they can't see their need for God I hope you showed up this morning because you need the Lord because you came to worship him because you came to fellowship with your brothers and your sisters why because the greatest deliverance of all is deliverance from self I tried it my own way I did it in my own strength it doesn't work so the solution is not within it's in him and if I could go to him and I could see him I could find out who I really am but some of us are like Peter we want God to tell us who really are but first you need a revelation of the Christ he said you are the Christ the son of the living God and then Jesus said in return and you are Peter and upon this rock of revelation that I'm the Christ I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail so Jesus is building a victorious church But if Jesus isn't building your church, the gates of hell will surely prevail. If it's not built on him, oh, it might draw a crowd and there might be a lot of money and flashing lights and smoke. But, oh, it's going to burn up in the judgment. You don't want that. So let's talk about feelings of shame. Number one, I have ten of these and this is where it's going to get deeper and a little harder to swallow. So just hang tight. Number one. The stuff no one knows about is the bedrock of our shame. The stuff nobody knows about. Let me ask you a question. What are the things about you? What are the things that you've done? What are the things that have been done to you that no one knows about? This is the bedrock of your shame. And shame is a powerful, negative, toxic, poisonous force. That will suffocate and drain the life of God in you. Why? Because what you hide reveals your pride. And what you conceal, God won't heal. It's that simple and that hard. What you hide reveals your pride. What you conceal, God God can't heal. Why? Because 
He wants you to open your heart to Him. And He's always all your life going to be knocking on that door. Knocking on that door. But listen, when it comes to pride and shame, these are like two sides of the same coin. Why? Because pride will puff you up, but shame will shut you up. Shame has the power to silence you. Some of you struggle to speak up. Some of you always have that moment of, oh, yeah, I thought about that, but I didn't say anything. Why? Because shame stole your voice, but the Lord Jesus Christ is here this morning to give you back your voice and give you back your choice. Oh, I wish somebody would get in the Holy Ghost with me. He wants to give you back your voice. He wants to give you back your choice. He wants to raise you up, but first, you're going to have to turn in your voice victim card oh I'm telling you the enemy will help you feel sorry for yourself he will serve you endless shots of self pity until you're so drunk on how bad you have it and somebody always has it worse so the stuff no one knows about is the bedrock of our shame number two shame thrives in secrecy Causes us to hide from God and from others. The reason why some people are personable and the reason why some people are hard to get to know has everything to do with shame. We blamed it all on personality, but really it's just upon healing. If your father or your mother was cold, was distant, was harsh or hard, I submit to you that they were covered in shame. That they were probably doing the best they could with what they knew. They, they, were, they were trying, but there was brokenness there. And they may have passed things on to you or modeled things to you. Y'all, it's a really painful experience if you've ever talked with someone or counseled them who they became what they hate. Or they created the same home environment that killed them. They created the same lawlessness. Why? Because the power of shame. And Jesus delivers us from this cycle of shame. We'll get there I just need you to hang on number three shame produces feelings of worthlessness insufficiency and inadequacy which leads to hopelessness number four shame causes us to reject love and the care of others whom God sends to us God sends people to us to love us, to care for us, to nurse us to life. But some of us simply reject whom the Lord sends. We put walls up. See, listen, the body of Christ is social. She's not relational. Uh, we'll show up and shoot the breeze, but what's really going on in your life? Oh. oh we're talking about koinonia, deeper levels of fellowship. Telling the truth is the highest form of intimacy. If you can't tell your spouse the truth, your marriage may be a house of cards. But rock bottom can be the foundation upon which you rebuild your marriage and rebuild your life. There's hope this morning, amen? amen. Come on, hang in here with me. I know it's heavy. Number five. Shame feeds the fear of rejection and the fear of being misunderstood. Rejection is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Rejection causes you to expect rejection, so you eventually get rejected. Some people feel like they just have a, a special cloak of rejection assigned to them. But really, it's self-fulfilling. Why? Because you maneuver and posture yourself in relationships in such a way that that fear of being rejected causes you to hide and then you eventually get rejected. I don't know how many people complain that, hey, nobody knows me and nobody calls me. And God wants to remind you that the phone works both ways. I don't know how many people, they, they leave their church, oh, nobody cared about me. Well, you know, yeah, you, you, you sat in the back, you showed up late, you left early, you didn't really want to, uh, what are we supposed to do? Just tackle you in the parking lot? Hey, tell us all your day, you may, whoa. 
I, some, some people are, are just happy being on the outskirts. You're just happy being an outlier. But God wants to bring you into deep covenant connection and community with God and others. And oh, it's going to be messy. Newsflash, most people leave their church because they just don't want to learn how to love. Stand up in this room if you're perfect. All the people in the back are like. <laughs> so we're going to have to work through some things. We're going to have to talk through some things. We're going to have to love each other, which is the whole point. God wants us to be known for our love. But unfortunately, the world has experienced the church as cold, unloving, distant, cliquish. Why? Because shame divides us. Shame silences us. But God has healing for our shame. You can overcome the power of shame. You can overcome deep feelings of shame. I'm telling you, there's a deep work of the Holy Spirit that's happening right now in this place. Number six. Shame makes you feel like you're too much and not enough simultaneously. Oh, my Lord. If I really... Some of you, like, you apologize for being yourself. Like, when you start to... Listen, everybody's goofy. Can we admit it? Everybody, I don't care how introverted you are, how wounded you are. There's some point in the day where you tap your foot and you make an accent or you sing in a voice or you do something a little funny. You know, God wants to bring you into a place that's safe where you can just be yourself. But then when we are, so it's like we apologize. And by the way, we apologize for being broken. Like we have a moment of weakness and then we, we feel this urge to say, hey, hey, I'm, I'm sorry. What you, why, why are we apologizing for God healing us? Why? Because we, we want people to perceive us as perfect. I knew this was a word from the Lord when I went to the bathroom. <laughs> Hang on, I don't get nervous. <laughs> I walked in your bathroom... And in the bathroom, there's a sign. And that sign says, can anybody tell me what it says? Yeah. It says, you matter, and your story matters, and we want to hear it. You matter, your story matters, and we want to hear it. Y'all, if you're here, and you're in Flowery Branch, Georgia, and you're in this region, God has connected you to this place because you matter, your story matters, and there's a safe place for you to share your story. You have one of the realest, rawest preachers in the entire country. I know it's what you love about him. But it comes with a cost. It comes with a price tag. I told him during prayer, I said, bro, this is a house of healing because of how you have stewarded your pain. No, oh, it's time for you to come underneath the care of the shepherd. Stop resisting the care of God in your life. That fear of being misunderstood, by the way, is why people always clarify themselves. Like before we say something, we clarify what we mean and then we have to spend a minute saying what we don't mean. Uh, and I'm like, can you just spit it out? I'm not trying to misunderstand you, but you know what? Some people are dedicated to misunderstanding you. Some of y'all have family that have made it their life mission to misunderstand you. If you really want to understand, ask questions. What did you mean? Give people the benefit of the doubt. Why? That's what love does. Number six. Oh, we did that one. Let's do it again. Number seven. Shame prevents vulnerability and causes us to regret it when we are vulnerable. Some people, you, you just can't, you can't go there. Why? Because there's deep shame over you, I'm telling you. 
And then when you, when you finally break open some of those doors. See, some of us had a negative experience. Some of us shared and it didn't go well. We shared and we got judged. We shared and we got hurt. Y'all, when people share their story, it's not ammunition. It's information. It's intelligence so that you can pray for them, not accuse them, not gossip, not slander. I'm telling you, we would be immediately healthier in the body of Christ if we stop talking about people that aren't in the room. Well, why are you having that conversation? Why are you talking about people that aren't here? Is it something that you need to go directly to them and say? But you're afraid of rejection, so you won't tell the truth? So the culture of self-protection continues? Some of you are hearing me. Number eight. Shame makes you feel guilty for being blessed. My Lord. I, I, I got it on sale. I, I got a really good deal on it. Don't worry. Uh, well, that's a, that's a really nice jacket. Well, that's, that's expensive. Oh, yeah, it was on, it was on sale. Or, no, somebody gave it to me. You, you know, preachers, the church is so in an impoverished culture that preachers have to say, somebody gave it to me. And the funny part is, if somebody gives you something really nice, people judge you for having something nice that you didn't even pay for. Wow, you're in Mexico again? Yeah, it's the favor of the Lord. Our friends invited us. Some of y'all won't invite people over to your house because you don't want them to know how nice it is. And maybe they need to see that you've been blessed because you've been faithful. Number nine. It's going to get more real. Avoiding conflict is the elephant in the room. But shame is the elephant in the bedroom. I know there are young ears in here, so I won't go on, but you can take the point. Why? Because shame causes husbands and wives to sleep together, but they won't pray together because it's a deeper form of intimacy. Now, why is it so hard to just say, baby, let's pray? Let's pray. I, I met a man whose marriage was in shambles for 15 years, and he experienced a dramatic shift in his marriage, and he said it was because I finally humbled myself and started praying with my wife. True story. Number 10. You almost made it. Shame is the root cause of substance abuse, body image issues, eating disorders, self-harm struggles, and sexual dysfunction and deviancy. Shame is the bedrock of this stuff. Shame is what we don't want to talk about, but shame is what we desperately need healing from. I want to remind you, the Lord is saying over you here in 2024, what? You are enough. You are enough. Some of you still won't move your lips because something's got to shift. Something's got to give. You've got to break up with shame and get in covenant with God your Father who loves you, who knows you, who sees you, who's not ashamed of you even when you're ashamed of yourself. Now I think Jesus told a story about a father who was looking from a long way off. From the son who came home out of the pig slop and he didn't even make him change his clothes. He hugged him, he embraced him and it says he kept on kissing him. The father is looking for some of y'all. He's looking at you from a long way off and it's time to come home back to the house of the Lord. Back to the father's house and receive the love and mercy and grace of God. Yes, the gospel is so good that you can have another chance just when you thought you ran out of grace God's got a whole lot more 
I know we're afraid of everybody abusing grace and using it as a lifestyle of sin. Grace will always empower you to say no to sin and yes to Jesus. Grace is not an excuse for sin. It's time for the church not just to know the pardon of grace, but the power of grace to set you free. Amen? So shame is the root cause of all these things. Shame is the reason why we're self-conscious. Shame is the reason why we, we think about ourselves. Let me ask you a question. When a group photo is taken, who do you look at first? <laughs> some of you are like, whoa. Uh, so, some of you, we like stand in the back. Well, what's going on? We're, we're ashamed. God wants to heal us of our shame. I'm telling you, some light bulbs are coming on. Some things are clicking. Y'all, I have lived a life covered in shame. This is why I can minister this way. I can see it because God has revealed it to me. Section number three is called freedom from shame. Everybody take a deep breath. One more, one more. There's freedom. I'm not going to leave you here. God's not going to leave you in this place. Freedom from shame. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 4. We're going to look at a few of these scriptures together. 2 Corinthians 4. Jesus, the surgeon, the healer is here. God is so good, so faithful. It's not an accident that you're here today. It's by the providence of the Lord. He loves you. He wants to set you free. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, would you say mercy? mercy. Say it one more time. Mercy. We do not lose heart, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame. Not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Did you catch that part where we renounce the things hidden because of shame? So some of y'all, the, the Lord is speaking to you. He's revealing to you. He's showing you. He wants to talk to you about those things that you did or that were done to you. You are going to have to renounce the things hidden because of shame. The word renounce there means to oppose. How do we oppose the things that we hide because of shame? We tell our story. See, Ann Voskamp said it best. She said that shame dies when stories are told in safe places. Just get it in the light. Get it in the light with safe people. Get it in the light with mature people. The very thing that you don't want to talk about is the very thing that God wants to address in your life. Maybe it's the very reason why you don't experience the presence of God like you want to, like you see other people encountering Him, because shame is suffocating you, but the wind of God is blowing through your soul this morning. Renounce the things that are hidden because of shame. Why? Because we've received mercy. Because there's grace from the Lord. Because God is not intimidated. I was just ministering to a man in Kentucky. He was weeping like grown men weep when they're in deep, deep pain. And he turned and he said to me, I need to tell you something that I've never told anybody in my life. And I thought, here we go. He's getting free from his shame. God is liberating him. This is a 30-some year old man. That says when I was 11 years old. And he went in to tell me the story. And it will remain between me and the Lord. But I immediately prayed for him. Cried with him. And then I said you need to tell safe people in your life. You need to make sure that I'm not the only one. Because this is just the beginning of God healing you. 
Shame is the reason why we reject the love of the Father. It's the reason why Christ himself could show up in this pulpit and preach the fatherhood of God and preach the love of God and teach the mercy and grace and forgiveness of God. But something in us might still reject the message. Why? Because it sounds too good to be true, but I'm here to tell you, it's the truth. It's real. God is gracious. Isaiah said that he longs to be gracious to us. God's not looking to cast you out and throw you down. And God never shames us, His people. See, but because shame is such a heavy yoke on some of you, you hear truth not as conviction but as condemnation. Why? Because it gets distorted. The Holy Ghost begins to work, begins to reveal, begins to show us things. We think, man, some things need to change in my life. But you know what? Delayed repentance causes conviction to morph into condemnation. You got to repent now. You got to talk about it now. You got to get it into the light now. Tomorrow's not the day. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of healing. Today is the day of the manifest power of God. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Turn with me to Hebrews 2. I'm almost done. Hebrews chapter 2. Just one verse here. Hebrews 2.11. It's a beautiful verse. I'm avoiding all the other verses because I'll get lost. So Hebrews 2.11 simply says, For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brothers. So Jesus, the perfect one, who not only never did anything wrong, but did everything right, is not ashamed to call you and I brothers, sisters, family. Why? Because we have the same Father. Because Jesus came to earth to reveal the Father, to make Him known, to bring Him out behind the curtain of invisibility and reveal Him. So if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. If you want to know what He hates, if you want to know what He prefers, Look to Jesus Christ. He is the Word made flesh, manifesting the nature of God. Some of you need to know that Jesus is not ashamed to call you family. He told them, I ascend to my God and your God, my Father and your Father. Did He teach us to pray and say, Our Father? reason why we named it our Father's house in Indiana is because we wanted it to be a place for all to know the Father. For all to walk with God. God is fathering each and every one of us that believe in Jesus. You're a child of God. And the Father is not going to give up on you. He's not going to quit on you. He's not tired of your mess. He wants to help you through it. He wants to turn your mess into a message. He wants to turn your trash into a testimony. This is the redemptive power of God. Your story doesn't have to stop where you're at. It can shift. It can change and become a beautiful tapestry that God is weaving and creating. Just a few more in Hebrews. Turn to chapter 12. Hebrews 12 and verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Now listen to this. Who for the joy, would you say joy? Joy. For the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. How did Jesus despise the shame of the cross? Now look again, you would think that he endured the shame and despised the cross, but that's not what it says. It says that he despised the shame, 
He endured the cross. He despised the shame because he was focused on the Father and not himself. And this is why he could go through humiliation and crucifixion and pain. And it was for the joy set before him. If I were being crucified, it would be all agony in front of me. But what did Jesus see that produced joy in him that would cause him to go to the cross? What was the joy? Raise your hand. All across the room, raise your hand. What was the joy set before him? That he would endure the cross. Raise your hand. It was you. It was me. It was us. It was a people that he was going to redeem and wash and heal and restore. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus. That he would despise the shame. I'm trying to motivate some of y'all to despise your shame. To tell your story. To break the power of silence. The yoke of bondage that has been upon you. Some of you for decades. Because it's a new year. And this is your year of healing. This is your year of victory. This is your year of breakthrough. Oh y'all don't believe me. This is your year where everything changes. This is the year. Where you put it all behind you. And you really become a new creation. In Christ Jesus the old. Can really pass away. You can bury it. You can have a funeral. You can dress up in all black. You can put on the tie. And say bye bye. He's dead. She's dead. It's all gone. It's under the blood of Jesus. As far as the east is from the west. So has he removed our sins from us. Oh, I wish somebody would get excited this morning. Who is this Jesus that would deliver us and heal us and care so much about us that he would take up his cross? That he would be beaten and spit on and mocked and abused for me, for you. I lived my whole life covered and saturated in shame. My mother walked out on me and something breaks inside of a young boy because mama's supposed to be there. I know we have great literature about the father wound, but the mother wound where we're still learning what does all this mean. But that left a cloak of shame upon me where I felt like, man, I wasn't good enough. I remember getting my lunch. We became so poor because of all the disaster that struck my family. We became so poor. Y'all know that poverty, there's great shame there, yes? Uh, you, You can be ashamed of being blessed. Well, there's deep shame over being poor. I didn't get my driver's license until I was almost 19 years old. Why? There was no point. There wasn't any car to drive. I remember going through the lunch line at our high school and I was so ashamed of my home life and what we didn't have. No furniture in a house, couldn't afford to heat in a foreclosed home in the winter in Indiana. And y'all, that's cold. That's really cold. That's your nose breaking open and bleeding bloody all over you and your toes turning white and waking up because your hands are numb. That's cold. That's poor. Some people would say po because you can't afford the O-R. It's, it's just poor. Po. We was po. I remember going through the lunch line and at our high school, you got a, some of y'all here, you remember this, you got a, a, a plastic tray for your lunch. But you know what the kids on the reduced lunch got? A styrofoam tray. That might not mean anything to you, but it means a lot to me because I remember the shame of having a styrofoam tray. Oh, look at all the poor kids. And you got a milk and some nasty food. So you know what I did? I put on a hoodie almost every day and I started stealing out of the rich kid lunch line. And I started selling food (laughs) to people at a discounted rate. I know the double cheeseburgers from Burger King are $2.50, but I got them for you for $1.25. Act now or it'll be $1.50. Why? I was just trying to survive. I was just a kid. I was trying to, I was too embarrassed to tell my dad that my lunch money ran out a long time ago because I knew we didn't have any money. So I figured I'll just work my way, I'll just find my way through, I'll just be a survivor. And one of the greatest nights of my life is when I got enough money to buy a space heater. I was able to put it in my room, I was able not to shake and freeze all night long. 
If I had that styrofoam tray. Some of y'all have that styrofoam tray. God wants to give you the real deal. He wants to put food on your plate. He wants to put food on your table. He wants to wash you in His love. He wants you to know that your circumstances are not a measure of you. And that our circumstances are not what we measure God by. He's not on trial. I want to give you three ways, three keys. I believe will bring bring freedom from shame. And if I could ask the worship team just to join me up here, I'm believing for the Lord to break it open this morning and to minister to some hearts. Number one, just want to keep it practical, keep it real of how you can pursue freedom from shame. Number one is to seek the mercy and the forgiveness of God. Now we seek the mercy and the forgiveness of God for what you've done. Because there's guilt on us. If you've sinned, if you're in sin, if you say, hey, I'm far away from the Lord. I've been entertaining some things that I shouldn't be. I've been looking at things I shouldn't look at. I've been in fellowship with the world and with darkness. You need to seek the mercy and the forgiveness of God. Because God is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you got to confess your sin. you got to own it. Don't blame it on somebody else. When I was immature, I said, God, forgive me for I don't know what I'm doing. And then I grew up and said, Lord, forgive me. I knew exactly what I was doing and I did it anyway. Seek the mercy and the forgiveness of God for what you've done. Number two, reveal your secrets and tell your story. This is for what was done to you. Those of you that have been victims of abuse, you've been victims of neglect, you've been taken advantage of, you need to reveal your secrets and tell your story. Now, I'm not suggesting that you get up on a microphone because the exposure would be too painful. But I am encouraging you to make sure that you have people in your life. I believe there's safe people here at this church and this ministry. I'm telling you, God told me it's a house of healing. The healer is here today. The father is here today. But you've got to tell your story. You've got to reveal your secrets. Remember, what you hide reveals your pride. What you conceal, God can't heal. The most powerful thing that you could do today could be to reveal what's been in darkness, what's been locked up, what's had you in chains and bondage. Number three, and with this one, I want you to stand to your feet. just going to host this presence this morning if you need to leave please feel released and blessed so thankful you could be here today receive a new narrative over your life number three I had a dream one time years ago And I saw Jesus in this dream. I've seen him a few times in dreams. So very, very humbled. But I saw him writing. And Jesus was writing. And he was writing on what looked like a piece of parchment paper. I don't know. And I walked up to him and I was curious like, what is Jesus writing? And when I looked and I got closer... I noticed that he wasn't writing with a pen. He was writing with some kind of quill looking thing. Now, I don't want you to think like uh, Thomas Jefferson signing the Declaration of Independence. It was cooler than that. But he had this, this quill, and I noticed that he wasn't writing in ink, he was writing in blood. He was dipping that thing in blood. And he was rewriting my story. And he was giving me a new perspective of my story, of my life. I realized that my perspective of my journey was different than his. I had believed lies along the way about me, about God, about life. And there was the Lord Jesus 
rewriting my story. Some of y'all need to receive a new narrative today. Some of y'all need to receive a new narrative. You got to receive it. You got to want it. You got to let it go. You've got to release some things to the Lord. You've got to stop calling to mind all those things that He's already forgiven you for that are already nailed to the cross and under the blood. But He wants to rewrite your story. He wants to give you a, a new and a fresh perspective of this journey that you've been on. He wants to show you that He was there. Right there with you. In the moment of your greatest pain. In the season of your greatest agony. In the midst of disappointment and trial. God was there. And God is here now. And God will forever be with us. Lord, would you wash us your people in a new narrative today. God, I'm praying right now for my sisters. Father, I'm asking in Jesus' name that you would break it open for the daughters of God in this house. Lord, those that have been victims of abuse and trauma, those that have been hurt, those that have been violated, God, I thank you that you're a God who heals, that you're a loving Father, that you're a tender Father, that you're a merciful Father. Lord, I'm asking that you would break down every box and every wall, everything that hinders us, that keeps us stuck. Everything that would want to cause us to remain frozen in this moment. Lord, I'm asking for a hot wave of your love to begin to thaw the hearts, the minds. To begin to soothe the soul. Would you begin to pray with me? Holy Spirit, we need your help right now. God, we need your help. Some people need deliverance. And it's not about what somebody else thinks in this moment. It's about getting our breakthrough and getting our healing. It's about not delaying the inevitable one more minute. You don't have to live another year stuck in shame and bondage. You don't have to live one more minute pretending to be something and someone you're not. As the most anointed you is the authentic you. God, would you release your healing oil right now? From the top of our heads to the soles of our feet. I thank you, Jesus, that you're not ashamed to call us brothers. You're not ashamed to call us daughters of the living God. Lord, I thank you for the family of God. And I thank you for the church. I thank you, Lord, that the manifold wisdom of God is to be revealed through your church. Lord, I'm asking right now, that all self-protection, that every inclination we have to resist you in this moment would leave in Jesus' name. If you need healing from shame, I want you to come forward this morning. I know it's going to be hard. It's going to take courage. But the Lord didn't send me here for just one or two. There's a host of people here that need a fresh encounter with God. If you want to overcome the power of shame. I want you to come forward right now. It always gets easier the more people that come. Just come. There's dozens this morning. The Holy Spirit's going to work. He's going to heal. He's going to soothe. If you're on the prayer team, please feel released to minister. I want to lay hands on as many as I can and just pray and prophesy. And if you've not come forward, I want to challenge you just to take a few minutes and begin to pray if you would stretch out your hands towards those that have come forward this morning let's be a family let's be the family of God come on continue to pray thank you Lord thank you Holy Spirit just fix your eyes on Jesus we're not going to get out of this moment too soon I was given the liberty just to press in, so we're going to press in. Feel released if you need to go, but God's working. He's moving. The Holy Ghost is healing.